Mac Power Users, episode 680, Workflows with Marco Arment. Hello, and welcome back to Mac Power Users. My name is Stephen Hackett, and I'm joined, as always, by my friend and yours, Mr. David Sparks. Hello, Mr. Hackett. Hey, how are you? Good. Good. Uh, We we got a, a very special guest today, but you've got a little housekeeping first. Uh, Yeah, we're selling shirts and sweatshirts and hoodies at Max Barkey. I haven't done this for like four or five years, but uh, I made the new logo last year when I went indie, and I've had several people ask for merch. So we have merch, and it's really nice merch. It's it's similar sweatshirts and T-shirts. It's the same vendor we use for the Mac Power Ranger stuff. It's got the embroidered logo, uh, um, and it looks really nice. Uh, it's uh, they're black and blue with silver thread, and they look great. If you're in the Max Parkey Labs, watch your email. There's a separate uh, one coming out for Labs members if you want to get that one. Uh, but I'm uh, I'm real happy with it. Looks great. I can't wait for you to get them, and I actually can't wait to get my own. And there'll be a link in the show notes. So so get them. They're only sell for a limited time. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, today on more power users. Well, actually, before I say that, I think we should introduce our guest. Welcome to the show, Marco Arment. Hey, thanks for having me on again. It's been it's been a while. Yeah, it has been a long time. And uh, and thanks for coming on. Uh, Marco is going to be talking to us today about all the stuff he's doing with his tech, some thoughts on Apple. Um, we have a lot in the outline uh, on more power users. Uh, this is something I specifically wanted to talk to Marco about. Um, he put his son in an Apple watch several years ago, and I just wanted to hear how that's going. And <laughs> it sounds like a restraining device. <laughs> <laughs> or if your son is very tiny. That didn't sound very good, did it? The way I said it. Yeah. He gave his son an Apple Watch. And I just go. wanted to hear how that was going. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Sometimes I'm a little too, uh, as a parent, I think I'm a little too uh, too cold. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's relative. I mean, my parents were... Uh, Man, they were taskmasters, and uh, I, I'm warm and fuzzy compared to them, but I'm not warm and fuzzy compared to probably more recent parents. I think it's just relative. But anyway, Marco bought a watch for his son. We're going to talk about that in more power users, <laughs> in, in addition to my parenting inadequacies, I guess. Um, but, uh, but before we do that, Marco, it's so great to have you back on. Uh, for those who don't know him, uh, he... Uh, sometimes blogs at marco.org. You don't do a lot of that anymore, but it's it's a great blog. He also is one of the co-hosts of the um, Accidental Tech Podcast, ATP.FM. Uh, he's on the Relay Network, on the uh, Top 4 and Radar Podcasts. You are a very busy guy, Marco. Oh, yeah, and also you make a little app called Overcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do a whole bunch of things, and I have very bad time management, <laughs> and so I don't do any of them um, particularly, you know, evenly or consistently. Um, with the with the exception of of the you know the, the podcast recordings because those are scheduled, and if they weren't scheduled, I wouldn't do those very evenly either. <laughs> but <laughs> I've somehow managed to plow through and and you know still be in business here. Uh, you know, with my erratic and poorly managed ways of working. <laughs> uh, you know, people say that, right? And I think that there there is some truth to the fact that if you get like better at productivity apps, they can help you be more efficient. But that's not a measure of success to me. It is the ability to kind of ignore the outside world and make something, which is a different skill set. And I, I feel like when you say when you tell me you're not good at time management, you're good at at focusing in on your projects because you ship a lot, man. I mean, Overcast is a really great app, constantly updated, and and your podcasts are really good. I I I do think there's a whole bunch of people like you out there who say, well, I don't do good at those productivity apps, so I must be not be productive. And honestly, I think that's that's not right. You know, you got to think about your ability to ship, and and there's plenty of people who are good at productivity apps who aren't good at that. So it goes both ways. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I think what's What's always been tricky for me is is not the tools or the apps or the scheduling. Um, it's and it isn't even that I don't have enough time. It's that I am just not very organized and structured and disciplined 
in, okay, I'm going to sit down during these eight hours and I'm going to work on this project and not going to let myself get distracted, not going to go do anything else, not going to go, you know, oh, look, I can walk the dog right now. It's nice out. Like there's so many, you know, life distractions and work distractions and and play distractions that I often will let into my life because I want them, you know, and and or, you know, I, I want to spend time with my family or I want to enjoy the nice day or, you know, or I, or I want to go try this this experimental you know, thing I want to play with, like some, you know, maybe some new feature of the app or some new coding toy, like, you know, these AI things. And, and I want to go play with them. And, and most of the time, none of that results in anything productive, but I still want to do it. And so I have, um, I, I, I do a lot of different things, but I don't do any of them for very long spans at a time. And, and so I'm kind of jumping between a million different things all the time every day. And that's that's the life I've I've willingly built for myself. I I like doing a bunch of different things, uh, and but and and there are downsides to that. Like you know, the downsides are that I'm really terrible at uh, completing long projects where there's not like clear incremental goals along the way. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. But you know, a, a big part of that is just like you know, the way I live is very much like you know, little time slots here and there. Oh, I'm going to take the next two hours, do this. Two hours, do that. One hour, thirty minutes here and there. You know, it's these quick little time slots that I'm kind of juggling all these different projects in. And and it makes it hard to uh, estimate time for longer commitments. It makes it hard to do longer commitments. Um, but this is kind of just me finally um, admitting to myself, this is how my brain works. And this is the kind of life I want to lead. And figuring out that it's okay for me not to be one of these, like, you know, very disciplined you know, scheduling, time tracking, you know, to do app using kind of kind of people. I, I wish I was. I, I wish I could do that. And I've tried doing that over the years. Um, but I've always come back to my kind of, uh, you know, less structured, more jumbled and, and more, you know, short time slot based work style. Well, as somebody who kind of is that category, a productivity person, I can tell you that it it is it can become a weight around your neck because like that's the way some people do it. Like they get into this stuff and they start getting good at those apps and they think, well, now I can do twice as much. We just talked about this yesterday in a labs meetup I had and people, I feel like there's this like spectrum when you start playing with productivity, you start to get better at stuff, but then you take on too much and you just put yourself right back in the same trap you were before where you're still working all the time. You're doing more, but you're still running yourself into the ground. The real trick is to learn those tools and then use them for good, not evil. You know, like use them, get the work you decide to do done and then have time to go play with AI or play video games with your kid or just take a walk on the beach with your dog or whatever it is that makes you happy. And I think that's that's when, uh, that's the Buddha move right there. You know, when you get to that point and, uh, uh, but, you know, I guess we kind of went off on a tangent, but uh, a lot of people say I'm not productive. I'm not good at those things. Well, you know, really, I think the way you measure productivity is by what you ship, not what tools you use. Yeah, well said. Well, that wasn't in the outline. <laughs> that's OK. That's <laughs> I mean, my entire life is a series of tangents, so that's fine. Like, that that, that yeah. fits with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing I want to talk to you, Marco, is, is about the longevity of your projects. I mean. ATP, as we record this, just turned 10 years old. Overcast will turn 10 next summer. In fact, I remember I was at a concert when you pushed the first beta to Overcast. So I'm like, at a concert, my wife was like, what are you doing on your phone? I was like, I'm trying out a new podcast <laughs> app. Um, she was not impressed. But, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've run these projects for a long time. And on the internet, that's not the easiest thing, right? The internet c- can have a pretty short attention span. And uh, I wonder, you know, when you start a project or when you think about what you're doing now, like is longevity a goal? Is it just because that's how it's worked out? How do you think about that? Well, you know, obviously there is some selection bias here in that, you know, the the things that have not lasted very long that, you know, I, I've tried a lot more things over the years and most of them didn't last very sure. long and they kind of fell by the wayside. Um, but, you know, the, and these are the projects that have succeeded and stuck around. Uh, but I, I think it's largely because a, a few factors play in here. You know, number one, like, you know, the ATP is is just it's such a good fit for all of us. You know, like we we found our market. So it has an audience and the audience is great and it's big enough to to sustain a, a nice business. And then 
you know, for the co-hosts, like for for the three of us uh, who do the show, we all just, you know, we're friends and we work really well together and it's really easy to work together. Like we don't, it's not a difficult show to make. It's time consuming because we, you know, we try to do a decent job of certain things, but, but it's, it's not like a slog to make that show because everything just, we, we work well together. We get along well together. We enjoy doing it and it makes good money for all of us. And so it's, it's just kind of, it's a nice kind of ongoing business there. And, and, and we've, we found our audience pretty early on and it's just kind of stuck. It's kind of stuck there for, you know, the better part or for a decade now. So that, that kind of just keeps going. Like, and there's, oh, because it's a news based show, we're always talking about, you know, the Apple news of the week or the tech news of the week. And so there's kind of infinite content to be had, you know, as long as there is tech news, which there always seems to be, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like we can, we could, we will always have a show there. And, and as long as we all keep doing it and keep wanting to do it, which I see no end in sight for that, um, that, that kind of sustains itself. And, you know, even, even as the ad market has had its ups and downs in the last few years, well, I mean, as it always does, but, you know, we've certainly had ups and downs in the ad market and, and we launched membership a couple of years back. And so, you know, similar to what you did at Relay. So, so now, you know, now we have this diversified income to kind of stabilize its ups and downs. And so that, that business has been great. And the show is a pleasure to do and, and we love doing it and the audience is great. And so that's kind of how that's sustained. It's just like, we just fell into this, this great fit and the, you know, this great set of, you know, the, the three of us as hosts, we have good chemistry together and, and it just worked really well. Um, and then Overcast is that, that kind of, I went through a lot of different uh, business models over the first few years of Overcast. Um, it, it took a while for me to figure out like what what can make sustainable recurring revenue here, um, mm-hmm. and and for a while like there were some ups and downs in 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 that business in the early years where I I actually thought like you know a few years in when things weren't going that well financially I was like mm, th- I don't know how much longer I'm going to be doing this app you know Cause, like because it's a fairly involved and expensive app to keep operating you know it ha- it has a pretty substantial server side infrastructure um, and it's just and, you know, podcast apps have a lot of needs. And you think people think of a podcast app as being like three screens. And it's so much more than that. And, and you don't realize until you try to make one, you're like, wait a minute. Oh, there's like 25 screens in this app. And there's all these, you know, back end components and, you know, the crawling and the feeds and dealing with publishers who, who, you know, <laughs> it's a common thing where people will um, just delete their feed and start a new account on a new host and not redirect the old one to the new one <laughs> and just change it in Apple Podcasts and just, you know, cross their fingers and hope everything works out. Right. And so there's, you know, dealing with stuff like that, dealing with, you know, all these, you know, moves of different hosts. And then, you know, the landscape changes over time. There's, you know, the the rise of dynamic ad insertion and and the the big business of podcasting, the tracking services, all the privacy invasion stuff that we now have to deal with. Um, and, and so it, it's just, it's a big business to keep on top of. And, and fortunately, after, I don't know, maybe four or five years, I, I finally did come upon a, a good stable business model combination where you know I I have a premium subscription for some premium features um, and then I have display ads in the app that are not just you know Google ads they're ads for podcasts and you can promote your podcast in the podcast app by buying an ad on my site and I just run that all myself it's not running through any kind of you know ad provider or anything and so that combination of having those two income streams again ads plus membership you know it's it's a similar story to ATP. Um, that's a really good combination for me. And so the business side took care of itself. And then because that's now taken care of, I was, I'm able to now to focus on just making the app. And, you know, for the most part, I don't need to do that much that often to, to move the app forward. Um, it's, it's a fairly mature app. And what most people are asking for are minor feature changes or behavioral adjustments. Mm-hmm. And so I've been able to sustain that over time as one person, um, because it's not too much of a workload. It's not easy, mind you, but it's not it's not too much. Um, now that being said, I think you know staying as one person for that business has really helped a lot. And with ATP, staying as just you know ATP is just a show that is owned by the three hosts. There's no investors. There's no network. There's no owner. There's no like streaming partner or any anything like that. It's just a podcast we put out on our own site with our own stuff, and it's and it's fine. Overcast is an app that has no investors, no no company backing, no employees. It, I'm the only person who works on Overcast. And what that does, it it kind of takes me out of the like the VC rat race. And I and I've been in that before. I know how that works. Um and and what that does is kind of anti-longevity. You know, what 
what the what the startup world and the VC world and, and the corporate world to a large degree, what they want is big boom growth. And then some kind of big exit event after not too long of a time, whether they you know go public or more often get acquired, that's what they want. And so the whole structure is set up to make things that are fairly short lived, uh, and and that's what tends to happen in, in in our business a lot. Whereas when you're just one person with no investors and no employees, you don't even you aren't even on their radar. Like there, when there's there was this big boom of podcast company acquisitions that happened over the last few years, as as you know, people smelled money in the business, and no one came to me. Well, not really. Like there were no like serious inquiries <laughs> for for Overcast. Like, hey, we should, we want to buy you. Nope, I am off their radar, and and I consider that you know, in some ways, like yeah, no one's going to walk up to my house and and give me a billion dollars out of nowhere. Uh, but uh, I also you know the the upside is that. I can run this business however I want. I can do in the app whatever I want, and I'm in it for the long haul. You know, it's it's, good, it's good, you know the kind of slow and steady wins the race kind of approach of like I've been running this business now for almost ten years, and I don't see an end in sight in the near future either. Mm-hmm. You know, like unless the entire podcast world collapses in some really big way, which. I don't see happening, you know, e- even though, you know, people, there's been a few articles this week about how like podcasting is cooling off, but it's really all about just like Spotify is losing money on their podcast efforts and like, right. Okay. That's, that's one company with, you know, a handful of shows that they put a bunch of money into and it's not paying off. The good thing about podcasting is that it's way bigger than that. That's a drop in the bucket compared to the entire world of podcasts. So as long as the entire world of podcasts doesn't all disappear, <laughs> which would have, I think that would take a lot. Uh, then, you know, then the app has a great future, I think. And I can just sit here, you know, quietly doing my thing over in this corner of the podcasting world. And the the big rat race of big, you know, big mergers and acquisitions and investments and everything else, I don't really matter to them at all. They don't even know I exist, probably. And meanwhile, I'm over here having a really nice business and serving my people really well and and making this app that makes me happy. Yeah, it's one of the things I tell people who are interested in, in getting started, you know, sort of, some business or project on the internet is like the internet is a massive place and you don't have to carve out, you know, 25% market share of whatever thing you're looking at to make a living. Right. I mean, you know, relay and ATP Evercast, like all these businesses are related. We're all friends. Like we all think the same way about these things, but something we all have in common is like, none of us are enormous, but we all are big enough with hard enough work to make a living. And that's, something that is, I think, kind of special about like internet businesses because the potential market is so big, you don't have to capture the whole thing to make ends meet. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you know, the podcast business is, you know, even, you know, podcasting, while it is very successful and has reached a lot of the mass market, it's not like TV, you know, it's not like phones, you know, it, it, it doesn't reach everyone on earth. And in fact, podcasting is actually surprisingly non-diverse in the sense that it is largely still an English language medium. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of podcast production and consumption is still English language um, and and still fairly focused on, you know, U.S., Europe, Australia, Canada. Um, and so it, it's not a, it's not like, you know, the biggest market in the world, but I still do great as just, you know, by most measurements, I have, you know, roughly one to two percent of the of usage among client apps. Um, and it's it's hard to measure. It's hard to get good numbers on that. But that's that's some that's a rough ballpark as far as I can tell from what big hosts occasionally will report to me. Um, and so, but you know, having so having you know one percent of the market, that also though that makes me like the the fourth or fifth most popular podcast app, <laughs> which is crazy to me. Like that, it, it, there's there's a few there's a handful of big ones. There's Apple at the top. Apple is the biggest by far. Then there's Spotify. They're they're pretty big. And then I think Google Podcasts is ahead of me. And then there's me. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes those those, you know, the the bottom there kind of juggles around a little bit depending on who's measuring it and when. But you can you can capture a small part of a market and be very successful in that market still. Like one percent sounds like nothing until you realize there's only a handful of players above you. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, wait a minute. And then there's a whole bunch that, you know, have, you know, zero point one percent, you know, the stuff like that. So it's like, okay, well, um, this this is a this can be a good business. And when you're only at one percent, you have a lot of growth potential, right? <laughs> yeah, I think though there's kind of a bigger story here, and a lot of our listeners are interested in tech but don't necessarily work in it. And 
Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about this whole idea of startup mentality and the way it can wreck a business. Um, uh, there's just this idea that you have to get bigger. And th- this isn't even just in tech. This is in all sorts of businesses. But it's interesting to me how people can come with good intentions and good ideas, but then this drive for growth just destroys whatever it is that they started making in the first place. And I know you've witnessed that because you've been part of, you know, of some pretty big enterprises. And, um, you know, what's your take on that? How are we doing at this point in the industry in, in terms of nurturing little ideas that can help the world, but not necessarily become a trillion dollar company? I think it really depends on the problem you're tackling and and where you're coming from. You know, there is a huge role for that pattern in business and in tech and, and in lots of businesses, because what I can't do is anything that requires more than one person or a huge amount of time and capital investment before you get a profit, you know, because I'm just one person. And so there is a role for that kind of, you know, big boom investment cycle if you're doing things that, that you know, it, that, that will require a big staff to say, you know, look at something like Uber. I know this is, you know, stereotypical, but, you know, look at something like Uber. If you're trying to launch a service like that, you're going to need a lot of people. You're going to need like a, a huge amount of upfront investment to just get that going before you're going to have much chance of turning a profit. And so it, it makes sense that you would need a ton of investment to start that up, you know, and there's lots of things in tech and the non-tech world where that pattern still holds. And that is what allows things to happen and, and to get built. Uh, but in, but especially in tech, I mean, through, of course, other areas too, but especially in tech, there's also a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't need that. And that if you, if you just don't spend a whole bunch of money up front, if, if you can figure out a way to do something that doesn't involve massive expenditure up front before you even know whether your business works or not, uh, then you don't need that world as much or at all, and I, I feel like the it it, it kind of a, a lot of a lot of the the uh, I guess role of maintaining that possibility falls on gatekeepers in the in the tech world. You know, in in the olden days, there really weren't many gatekeepers at all. Um, now we have you know some pretty big ones. We have things like you know Google for web search. Um, we have the browser makers, Google being uh, the biggest one. Um, and, you know, for any kind of web thing, you get, you got to kind of make sure that you know the browsers are playing ball with you. Um, but it, in a much bigger sense, we have the app stores. Um, for almost any modern you know tech business today, you're going to probably run into Apple and Google as the app store runners. And 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 I think it's the the onus is on them to make sure that small like one person shops that don't have huge capital behind them can still get something out there in the world and have any chance of it being found or discovered or or succeeding and so that, you know that goes to things like when you look at the apple app store um there and I, I, this could be true in google i don't know I, I don't i don't play in the android world so i don't know um but you know in the apple app store world increasingly you have to spend money on search ads in apple's app store to get your app visible at all um, even or even to prevent people from like overbidding your own name in your own search results when people search for your app. Um, and so when they, when they start adding things like, you know, search ads becoming kind of a requirement to get found, um, that starts pricing out people and that starts making it harder for indi- for individual business to, 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 to get off the ground. And for people who, you know, if, if you don't have a lot of money, that's going to be hard to get started. Um, and so it's it's that kind of thing. Like, I, I hope the platforms remain cognizant of the of the the need of smaller players and people who are just starting out and who don't have marketing budgets or any budget behind them to be able to get something off the ground that goes to the stores that goes to tooling platform requirements legal requirements all of that and apple's been pretty good about that for the app store's history so far overall um but but it, there are these areas like the search ads where i'm getting a little bit worried about it This episode is made possible by our friends over at SaneBox. Email is out of control. We all get so much stuff we don't want, and we all want to try different apps and different services, and a lot of solutions to manage your email tie you into one application or one service. One of my favorite things about SaneBox is that it doesn't do that. So if I'm using Apple Mail or MimeStream on the Mac or I'm trying out a different iOS application, whatever it is, All my email filtering follows me around. It comes with me. SaneBox has some excellent tools for filtering out email. 
A sane later keeps your inbox clean with what only really matters. If you want to unsubscribe to something, you just drag it to the same black hole. You'll never hear from the sender again. You can snooze emails. You can set reminders, all sorts of great stuff. You can even offload your attachments to something like Dropbox or other cloud services if you're running low on space uh, with your email provider. Sandbox has various pricing plans. They start as low as about $4 a month. And there's a 14 day free trial. And get this two thirds of MP listeners who try Sandbox end up subscribing. That 14 day free trial is an excellent place to start. But my guess is you're going to want to pay for it before that trial is up. And when you go to sandbox.com slash MPU, you'll receive $25 off any plan. Once again, that's sanebox.com slash MPU for $25 credit on any plan. Our thanks to Sanebox for supporting the show. All right, Marco, it's been a long time since you've been on the show, so I'm guessing you're still rocking your uh, eight-year-old Mac, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't even know what I was using back then. Probably the iMac Pro. Was that, was that eight years ago? Uh, <laughs> I think it. Yeah, I think that's what you're using back then. It's been a while, and Apple has uh, been doing stuff. What, what's your current Mac? So I when when the whole Apple Silicon transition happened over the last few years, um, I started out uh, with a M1 MacBook Air. You know, their their very first or one of their very first Apple Silicon Macs, um, and I, ha- I just had that docked to a Pro Display XDR. Yes, I got the ridiculous giant thing <laughs> because and this was before the Studio Display was, was out. Um, that was my setup. That was my desktop setup for for a, a few months there. Uh, eventually, I I wanted that computer to be my laptop. And so I got a M1 Mac Mini. Yeah, that was also the, out at the time, um, yeah. and 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 it had had a little bit higher specs. That. Like I'd gotten the MacBook Air kind of as an entry level to kind of play with, and I wanted more storage, more RAM. So so I ended up getting like you know the, a beefed up version as the Mac Mini, uh, and use that as my desktop for a while. And then when the uh, you know roughly eighteen months ago, when the M1 Pro and Max MacBook Pros came out, I switched up the whole setup, and I was like, all right. I want more RAM than the 16 gigs these offer. I want more disk space. I have this great monitor now that's sitting on my desk, you know, <laughs> taking up <laughs> all this space and cost a bunch of money. So I'm like, all right, I want to make use of this monitor for a long time. So I'm like, I don't want to get just like, you know, an iMac or something. I want to switch it up. And at the time, the fast, like the, the Mac Studio wasn't out yet. And so the fastest chip you could get at the time was in the MacBook Pro. There was no desktop that matched its speed yet. Yeah. And so I got a 16 inch MacBook Pro as my desktop and I use it in clamshell mode. And then I also got a 14 inch MacBook Pro to be my laptop <laughs> with a bit lower <laughs> specs. And so I, I, it's the dual laptop setup. It's ridiculous. And I call, I call the big one, my desktop laptop. And I can honestly <laughs> very strongly recommend that kind of setup. You know, for years I, I had been juggling between, you know, I would always have a laptop and a desktop for mo- most of most of my computing life as an adult. I would have those two computers. And it used to be harder to have two computers. Now it's pretty easy. Now lots of stuff is cloud-based and synced and everything else. So now it's really easy to have multiple computers. Uh, and, you know, there are still occasional downsides, but it's not that much. Um, and the big one, I realize, like, you know, it, when, you, it, when you try to use a laptop as a desktop, if it's your only laptop, then you are constantly undocking it bring it around somewhere else and then redocking it. And so your windows are always losing their positions and everything's always getting jumbled around and it's kind of clunky and kind of a pain. Whereas the, my desktop laptop um, is always there or almost always just there in clamshell mode. But if I go on a trip and I want to bring like my main working computer, if I'm going to be doing like big work on that trip, then I can unplug it. And then I have all of my files, everything. It's my main computer I have with me. And I have the biggest screen that I can when I'm so like if I have to, like, you know, if I'm like going to produce a podcast where I'm going or if I'm going to be trying to write code where I'm going, I want the biggest, fastest, you know, big screen computer I can get, the biggest battery I can get. And that's the big one. But I also every day use a small laptop for something around the house or I'll take it into town to get some, you know, something done there or I'll take it like, you know, if I'm doing like a quick day trip somewhere where I'm not going to, I'm not planning on doing heavy work. I like having a laptop for that. I use a laptop for, uh, we, we do these FaceTime workouts with our trainer. So I use a laptop, you know, m- multiple days a week for that. And so I, I'm constantly needing a laptop around the house, but it doesn't need to be my big, fast, you know, crazy one. It just needs to be a laptop. So I have the smaller one for that. 
And then I have the big one for when I really need to take a work trip. And the rest of the time, the big one just sits there on my desk. And so I don't lose my window positions. Everything is always running and catching and, you know, everything is connected. I'm, I'm, I don't have to like unmap my network shares or lose all my terminal windows or anything like that. It's just always there, always connected. And it works exactly as well as a desktop. And, and what I think solidified the strategy for me was later on when those chips became available in a desktop, that was the Mac Studio. And that was probably halfway through that life cycle. Um, I wasn't tempted by the Mac Studio because it had a, an audible fan. Yep. And <laughs> right? And mine's under and the, my desk to avoid that problem. Yes. <laughs> and the 16 inch MacBook Pro has the same chip as the low end Mac Studio. And, and frankly, I didn't really need the advance of the high end one. It has the same chip as the low end one. And it's dead silent with everything I have ever done to it, except for one time where I ran like machine learning model training for four hours straight and. At that point, the fan turned on. <laughs> but normally, my regular work, I never hear it. So it's actually, in some, in, in, for my purposes, it's actually a better desktop than the desktop they release later that uses the same chips, and it's portable. So I am extremely happy with my 16-inch M1 M1 Max MacBook Pro. Um, the, I know the new ones just came out with the M2 Max. Um, I I have not been tempted to upgrade just because I'm I'm so incredibly happy with this one. You know, it's funny because I, I have the same setup. I didn't really plan it, but it kind of happened that way. I got the 16-inch MacBook Pro, and I used a lot. At the time, we were doing work on the house, so it was perfect for, you know, working in different locations. But I was just thinking, I'm pretty sure the last time I disconnected this thing was October. I, I just, <laughs> it just runs. And then, but the, the one difference is I didn't buy a second computer until they released the M2 MacBook Air, and that is my carry-around laptop. And the thing that's shocking to me is that for like 80% of what I do, the M2 Air is just as fast as the souped-up MacBook Pro. You know, it's it's uh, super fast for most work anyway. So I'm curious about like the 14-inch MacBook Pro. Was that because you need to do like faster work on it or just at the time, you know, you just – decided to go for the more expensive one because of the screen or some other reason. I, at the time, so what was, what was very important to me for, for the, the kind of, you know, around the house laptop, uh, yeah. like the, the small laptop, what's very important to me because of the, of the FaceTime workouts and, and some of the other things that we do with it, I want a really good speakers and, yeah. and like, you know, nice, loud, clear speakers. And I love, I actually have an M2 MacBook air for other kind of accessory reasons. Um, and I love, Everything about the M2 MacBook Air, except the speakers are t- are pretty bad on it, like relative to the bigger ones. And yeah. you know, not in absolute terms, but you know, relative to the 14-inch, you, you take a, a huge nosedive in speaker, both quality and volume um, when you go to the Air. Because there's, you know, there's not really space and volume in, internally to the, to the laptop for them. And, and so, but I, I, otherwise, I agree, like the M2 MacBook Air is fantastic in almost every other way. And And if I had to declare like, the one universal best computer for almost anybody, that's it. It's the it's the M2 MacBook Air. Definitely. And if I had to get all my work done on an M2 MacBook Air, I could. You know, I'd be a little bit, you know, if, if, if I didn't have a big screen, I'd be a little cramped. <laughs> but, but um, you know, gr- CPU power-wise, you know, like resource-wise, I could do everything I need to do on an, on an M2 MacBook Air and not only be fine, but actually be pretty happy with it. Uh, it I, I wouldn't, most of the time, I wouldn't notice the the uh the lower resources compared to the bigger ones um but but at the same time you know because the bigger ones exist i of course will choose them <laughs> but uh you know for for my heavy duty needs uh but yeah as a as a portable the macbook air is fantastic and, and there there are a lot of times where i if i'm on a trip that it's not going to require work i will take just the macbook air with me and, and i'm very happy with that and, and, you know, and like you i am constantly tempted to buy new Macs, but I just don't feel that with this MacBook Pro. I, I love this computer and I don't see why I shouldn't wait till M3 or M4, you know, before I do an update. Probably, you know, I, I'd like to wait till M4. I mean, why not? There's nothing that I'm doing now that this is not fast enough for. Mm-hmm. And um and but when that day comes, if I had to make the decision, let's say that, you know, we're several years in the future and I'm going to update it. I think I'd buy another MacBook Pro. I just, I love that it's there. I love that when I need, like when we went on vacation and I did need to do real work on vacation, I took the big one and it was yep. great. And 
you don't get that with a Mac Studio. And I don't know what the Mac Pro is going to be. We're going to talk about it later in the show. But I uh, I didn't intend to have this desktop laptop, as you would call it, but I am in love. Yeah, and I, I think I'd say the exact same thing. Like, you know, wh- whenever the, the Mac Pro comes out, you know, we'll see what it ends up being. But I am so happy with the desktop laptop setup. And and part of that also, you know, like I, I often will, uh, like I go between different locations. Like Like we, you know, we will often go to you know out of town or we'll go visit family and so there i actually do i I would miss it if i only had a desktop i would actually miss having that you know at at least five or six times a year and and maybe more Um, and so and and the advantages of a desktop are for the most part things that i wouldn't really need you know yeah i would of course i would love to have more you know cpu power when i'm compiling the app or things like that but it's it's not to a level where I'm so desperate for it that I'm willing to give up the benefits of having my main computer be portable when I need it to be, and and because that's a, that's a huge difference. Like it's it's not like having it having something be a desktop or a laptop is a massive difference in functionality. And for many people, they don't need that difference, or it's worth it, or they or they need the increased grunt of the desktop or whatever else. But I'm not one of those people. For me, it's more of a toss up, you know, resource wise. And so I will I will take the massive in- improvement in utility of the laptop over a desktop if the resource levels are at all close. Mm-hmm. You know, if a desktop is 10 times faster, OK, I'll have a, I'll have a harder decision on my hands. But the great thing about the modern Macs is that that's not the case anymore. They, you know, they really until very recently, really until until these until the Mac, the uh, M1 Max and, Mac, and M1 Pro MacBook Pros, there were such big trade offs in using a laptop as a desktop versus just buying a desktop. You know, it, up until the very end of the Intel world, the, or the Intel Apple world, at least. I know I know Intel still has their own world going, but we kind of pay less attention to it now. Um, but, you know, up until the very last Intel Macs, there were still big trade-offs of using a laptop as a desktop. And you were still often better off just getting a desktop. And I feel like now, with the exception of the, the monitor question, which is a big question, and that has been greatly improved by the existence of the studio display, um, but you know, if you as long as you can work out the monitor situation, however you however you need to work it out, then I would say the laptop as your desktop is a really great choice for almost everybody. And the, there are no major downsides. Like the reliability of clamshell mode is great. The noise is non-existent. Like it's it doesn't like overheat or bug out or anything. It's just it's really nice. It, it, it is uh it's, it's good times for mac fans let's just say that i mean i remember a few years ago Stephen and i were talking well will it still be mac power users if apple stops making macs well <laughs> <laughs> you know but they uh they uh they they have exceeded expectations I, but i want to switch over to the iphone real quick um well the very first time i met you you were carrying around a fancy camera i know that um that your wife uh, was a wedding photographer. I believe you were kind of involved with that a little for a little bit too. Mm-hmm. Um, you have this background in photography, but you also are a big iPhone fan. Where are you these days between fancy cameras and iPhones? I have almost entirely given up fancy cameras. Um, you know, I, I've always liked cameras on the technical aspects. Um, you know, being able to take a really like clear sharp well exposed you know nice color picture with good dynamic range and not a lot of noise like i was always into like the technical side of making technically great pictures i am not a photographer in in the sense of the artistic side of it um having any of the artistic background or or really artistic eye for it that's just not my that's not my skill um and so my 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 interest in fancy cameras actually very similar to desktops. <laughs> you know, my interest in fancy cameras over the years was I want to be able to get the best pictures I can when this matters to me. So if there's an important family event or whatever else, like you know, I want to be able to take really good pictures of that. And over the years, phones have just gotten so much better that phone cameras they're not better than big cameras in all situations. But they are better than big cameras in some situations, and they're better than big cameras in a lot more hands than than you would think or that we used to think. So, for me, like if you give me a big camera that has a you know nice you know nice full frame sensor, you know good glass in the front of it, you know something like you know really really highly spec'd, with that, I can do you know I, I can make a really technically great picture 
in many conditions, given some time. With a phone, I can take it out in any conditions and hit a button barely looking at it, and I know it's going to be good. And at you know the ceiling of how good the picture can be is way higher with a big you know nice camera than a phone but the floor of how bad it can be is not that bad with a phone and so in in situations where it's actually a little bit difficult to use a big camera like for instance if there's a big dynamic range difference in the scene you know you got a sun somewhere you got you know reflection off the water or whatever maybe some some sh- some shadow detail you want to capture that can be pretty hard to do with a big camera to do it right or to freeze motion, or to work, you know, in a lot of low light situations, and try to have anything in focus at all. Like it, th- there are areas with the big cameras, you know, you can do it if you put the work in, and if you have the skill, and if you have a little bit of luck, and maybe you can control the environment a bit better. But phones are so good now at capturing anything, anytime, from anywhere, that usually that utility wins out for me. And because I am not into the artistic side of it, really. I and and because the technical side is now being solved pretty well by phones most of the time, I have mostly stopped using big cameras, uh, except for like you know specialty events or specialty um, needs, like you know big zooms or something like that. But for the most part, I don't usually use big cameras. Yeah, and it's interesting to me, like just in my friends and family group, to see how many of them have like started to figure out all the features of the iPhone, like. I'm getting so many portrait mode photos from people who are not super into tech, but they have found portrait mode and they would never take them. They'd never have the money to put together a professional camera rig that could get bokeh, but now they're getting it all the time. Maybe sometimes too, too much time. I don't know, but the, uh, (laughs) but the, uh, but you know, and they love it so much and they're so proud of the photos they're taking or, um, the friends of mine that have young kids that are taking these live photos and just love the live photos. I mean, I wish I had live photos of my kids when they were little, frankly. Um, so I, I really think that you're onto something here and I do have a fancy camera too. I use for kind of the work I do, but when I'm out in the world, I don't, I don't bring it either. I just don't bring the fancy camera. Yeah. And that's the thing. And, and like to, to, to beat the quality of the phone camera, you now need to go pretty high end with the, with the separate cameras. Like you, it can't just be like a little tiny point and shoot that fits in your pocket for the most part anymore. Like now, if you want to have better pictures than a phone, you're looking at physically larger glass. Probably you're looking at larger sensors. Everything is more expensive and and you know has has kind of higher needs optically and things like that. And so if you if you really want to be better than a phone, it takes a lot now. And so so like you know it has raised the bar. And for most people, that's not that's no longer worth it. I mean, you know, as you were just saying, like what you're what you're seeing from people who are not, you know, super power users or tech nerds. Well, when was the last time you saw anybody who was not a nerd use a non phone or non iPad camera? Mm -hmm. It's been a while, right? (laughs) Like everyone else is using phones full time. Yeah, you've got to go out of your way to to buy, you know, a quote unquote real camera or you know big camera and the point and shoot thing is interesting too i mean that market there's a couple like real high-end ones i know sony's got a couple but basically that business is gone right all the cheap point and shoots people run around with like the iphone and other smartphones have just totally decimated it obliterated Mm-hmm. I mean, that used to be a thing and now it's not a thing yeah and we're mm-hmm. going to get email from listeners who are uh phone enthusiast i'm sorry camera enthusiasts and uh, are going to explain the different and i i get it you can take a much better picture with a good camera and good glass but it's just kind of shocking to me how much apple has kind of closed the gap and the simplicity of pulling out of your pocket and you also get you know, GPS, um, you know, tag on it automatically. You can share mm-hmm. it from your phone so easily, which is, you know, what people do with fo- photos. Now. I mean, compare the number of people that share a photo, whether it's be social media or just directly with friends versus the number of people that actually print a photo. And, you know, it's just not printing is just not a thing that's done by most people anymore. Yeah. That's the thing too. Like if you, if you want to use a big camera, what most people want to do after they take a picture is do something with it on their phone. And so there's always been this functionality gap and this kind of, you know, this 
this pain in the butt factory of trying to get the picture from the camera to your phone. And we've come up with all sorts of terrible hacks to try to do that over the years. Like first there were those those Wi-Fi SD cards. Remember those? Oh, I yeah. had a few yeah. of those. <laughs> Those were terrible. <laughs> I had a few, and every time they, every few years, they'd like release a new one, and they'd be like, "Oh, this one's good now." And of course, I'd buy it like a fool, and it wouldn't be good. <laughs> See, also, you know, the, the twelve inch MacBook, and then the butterfly keyboard, and everything else. Um, so, you know, there was there were all these hacks to try to get, and, and now we have like, all right, now you can install their app, and you can connect to the camera's Wi Fi network, and beam it over that way, and that also is terrible and clunky, and you know, not at all intuitive. You know, there 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 have been standards over the years that have been either part of Wi-Fi or proposed for Wi-Fi where you could have like a, a point-to-point thing where the phone wouldn't have to change the Wi-Fi network it's connected to. It could stay on its regular Wi-Fi network, but you could also then have it communicate over Wi-Fi to an accessory over like a separate channel. Uh, and I don't think Apple ever implemented any of those things uh, as far as I know. And what that would be good for would be it, having a camera be able to send things directly to the phone without having to you know mess around with stuff. And I feel like that would make such a huge difference in the usefulness of non-phone cameras. And maybe that's cynically why Apple hasn't implemented it. <laughs> you know, like there's there's a pretty good argument to be made they probably shouldn't do that from from their point of view. Uh, but I feel like if if that gap is is ever closed in a better way than it is now if it's if there's ever like a a small camera that you could you could have in your bag and you could pop it out and use it if you wanted to and then very quickly and easily have that picture show up on your phone without connecting to some wi-fi thing or launching some special app and waiting and having it reconnect like all that crap that you have to go through now if there was a really good way to do that where take a picture and within a few seconds it's on your phone i feel like that would greatly in, in, improve the market for these things, but until and unless that ever happens, uh, I don't. I don't see it. You know, I I would guess that if Apple's not working on it, it's not because they're afraid of people using that in lieu of their phones. I would guess it's that they've looked at the numbers and there are so few people um, that need this. That's such a niche feature that it's just they've chosen not to focus on it. Yeah, or it could be as simple as, you know, their point of view is, why would you use another camera? Ours is the best camera in the world. And yeah, that's, you could, that's you could make Apple. an argument for yeah. that. Like, it, yeah. you know, in, you know, not it isn't the best camera in the world in all specs or in all respects. But I think if you had to pick the best, what's the best camera in the world overall? Yeah, probably the iPhone Pro camera. Yep. Even though I have a thousand dollar camera, if I could only have one, it would be the iPhone. Yep. Agreed. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Rocket Money. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses. Just go to rocketmoney.com slash MPU. Do you know how much your subscriptions cost? Most Americans think they spend around $80 a month on subscriptions, but the actual total is closer to $200. If you don't know exactly how much you're spending every month, you need Rocket Money. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, like that streaming service you bought to watch just one show on or that free trial you never used. Rocket Money will quickly and easily identify your subscriptions for you so you can stop paying for the ones you don't want. Simply find the subscription you don't want and press cancel. Rocket Money will cancel it for you. There's no more long hold times with customer service or tedious emailing back and forth. Rocket Money makes canceling subscriptions as easy as a click of a button. I have signed up for and I use Rocket Money. I really like it. It feels like I've got a little personal assistant always watching over me in terms of my money. I get notes from Rocket Money when there's a large expense that I didn't expect or uh, income comes in or they figure out a way to save me money on my cable bill. They just take care of me. And I have found that I have saved money since I signed up for it. Uh, it's totally worth it. I am sold. The interface is pretty and easy to understand. And whatever is going on in the background to help me keep my money and not waste it, it really works for me. I've never been good with these financial software applications. I've never been very impressed with them. But Rocket Money does impress me because of the proactive way it helps me save money. Like you should just go check it out. It's Rocket Money dot com slash mpu r-o-c-k-e-t-m-o-n-e-y dot com slash mpu 
Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash MPU. And our thanks to Rocket Money for their support of the Mac Power users and all of Relay FM. So, Marco, you spend a lot of time uh, talking and thinking about Apple, big part of your job. And we wanted to see where you thought Apple would go this year. We're recording in February. Apple's year has actually already started a little bit. We had a couple of small announcements, the new the new HomePod being an example. But we're still in the Apple Silicon transition. Uh, there's rumors of new computers. Of course, we have AR and VR on the horizon. What are a few things you're looking uh forward this year from Apple? And and what do you think could be, you know, a year from now, what do you think we'll be looking back at being an important thing this year? That's a good question. You know, I I think what's probably going to be the headliner this year is probably whatever this this VR headset is from Apple. Um, And I I really don't know what to think about this product yet. And and I, I still I wouldn't believe that it was actually coming yet, if not for the very, very, very heavy rumor coverage that's saying yeah it's pretty much a sure thing and it's it's pretty much guaranteed to be sometime in the middle of this year Mm -hmm. um so it it, like you know there's enough smoke behind that that there's probably a fire there so it's probably a real thing but i frankly i couldn't be less excited about it right now as we stand because i you know the the current world of of vr and and mixed reality kind of headsets doesn't really excite me and so if apple's going to do a really good job of this I, I haven't yet seen like why this is going to make me happy, why this is going to improve my life or anything like that. So maybe once they release it, I'll be more excited about that and be more optimistic about that until they release it and show us why theirs is good. And until I can use it and agree that it's good, um, I'm not going to be super excited about that product uh, possibility. But if that does come out, that will, I think, define the year. I mean, let's be honest, like that that's going to do it, right? So other than that... Well, well I want to stop on that one for a minute. Um, sure. Because I, I have thoughts on it too, and I'm curious what you think. Is this something Apple should be making, first of all? And then second of all, what is the, the problem to be solved by it if Apple does it successfully? I mean, what would, in your mind, would be a successful uh, AR, VR goggle from Apple? You know, I really don't know. And this this is part of the part of the reason I'm not excited about this product yet is that I can look around like, you know, when when previous versions of their products have have entered new categories, you know, when when the first iPhone came out, smartphones had already existed and were already pretty successful. You know, obviously they brought it to to a much better and different level, but you could look around the market and you could see things like the Blackberries, the Treos, you know, you, the Windows mobile devices, like you you could look around and see, okay, these are smartphones. They they are a category that is succeeding that people love. Like people people loved their Blackberries back then. You know, that that was a that was a big deal back then. And so they enter the market and it's like, all right, people love this market. And then Apple comes out and Apple's gonna do a really, really good job of what we already know to exist. They didn't like invent the phone, they didn't invent the smartphone, but they did a really great job of a category that was already there. They then they did the exact same thing with the iPad with tablets. Tablets had already existed a little bit before the iPad. They had some success in some areas, nothing like the iPad, but you know, they, but they had some success. Um, and then Apple came out and did a really great job of what we already knew to be possible. Yeah, and and really in those categories, we were unhappy, right? I I feel like the phones were not great, and we knew it, and the tablets were not great, and we knew it. And Apple came in with a solution to make it better, right? Right. But but even then, it's like, you know, like the the like the Blackberries and stuff that were before the iPhone, they had massive utility to the people who use them. They just, you know, they were a little clunky and a little primitive in certain ways, but they they still had massive utility and people loved them. Right. Same yeah. thing. You know, the, the tablets were that was a much smaller market, but they they at least you know they had their verticals, they had their their devotees and, and they had people who love them. And then smartwatches, you know, the Apple Watch came out. Smartwatches had already started before the Apple Watch came out. Um, and, and so we already knew roughly what was possible with them and Apple came out and did a better job and the Apple watch took over and is doing great. And, and, you know, they made it eventually into a, into a good product and, and a good business. Um, but with the AR VR stuff, you can look around the market and you can see, okay, you know, you have like, you know, the, the, the Facebook, uh, quest two thing and the quest pro, um, and you have the, you know, a few gaming VR headsets from gaming companies, you, you know, the, the valve ones and stuff like that. And, PSVR, if those are still a thing, I don't, I don't follow it that closely. Sorry, but um, but, you know, so you you know, you have gaming, and you have you know, like the kind of 
the new kind of mixed reality or kind of office uses that that Facebook slash Meta is trying with the with the Oculus stuff now, but none of those seem to be like really sticking and, and really invaluable to people. You know, like like we we have we have the 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 Quest Two here. We got it a few years ago for gaming, and it's mostly our son who, who uses it. But you know, and my wife and I have tried it as well, and. It's it, it's a it's kind of a fun novelty for gaming. It's it's kind of like the Nintendo Wii when that came out. Like everyone got into Wii Sports for like a couple of months and then kind of didn't touch it again. It's it's that same kind of pattern. Like all right, we we played Beat Saber, we you know we played a few of the big VR games and had some fun with it, and now we kind of don't really touch it for the most part. <laughs> and our kid plays some games in it sometimes, but you know that's that's about it. Um, all of the new kind of officey things like the virtual meetings that Facebook is trying to make happen. I I don't really. I see a lot of a lot of challenges to getting that off the ground. And so when you look at, you know, the, the kind of tepid market response to what's been there so far in these in these headsets, I have a really hard time seeing what Apple's gonna do to really blow us out of the water here. Because you know, everyone's gonna be limited by battery tech, screen tech, size, weight, everything else. Apple's gonna gonna have those same limits in the same way, like, you know, you know, the the Apple Watch and the iPad and the iPhone all have the same limits as other products in their categories in terms of just physical realities and and where you know some some big components of tech like batteries and screens where they are at any given time so cer- certain limitations that the current ones have apple's going to have those same limitations or, this, or at least the same class limitations um and so we're not going to get like you know clear glasses that just fit in your head and you don't you don't you can't even see any electronics in them and all of a sudden you're projecting things onto the world that you can see you know in bright sunlight like that doesn't exist yet nobody can do that yet apple's not going to do that either yet uh, so Whatever they can do now is going to be technically probably not that different from what the um, the most recent existing headsets can do. Maybe Apple will be one or two generations ahead if they really, you know, because they have good resources, good engineering, you know, good deals with manufacturers. Maybe they can get one or two generations ahead of everyone else at launch. But it's not going to be like 10 generations ahead. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, they're probably going to, if, if you look at like, you know, whatever the, the MetaQuest Pro does, which came out recently, um, Maybe Apple will be, will be able to perform similarly to that or maybe one generation ahead of that or, you know, two at most. I still am not seeing the the huge benefit of what is that going to enable that's going to really make this a must have product for a lot of people. And so and look, I could be totally wrong. I'm wrong a lot. Maybe maybe I just am not seeing it. Maybe I don't have the foresight or maybe they really have thought of something that no one has thought of yet um, in a really big way. But that's not usually how this progress happens. Usually, they're not coming with something brand new that no one's ever thought of. They just come to the table doing a really good job of things we already knew to be possible. So I'm not sure what this is going to do, what this product's going to do that's going to make it stand out from the rest besides being just a nicer version of those things. And maybe that'll be enough. You know, that's what that's kind of what the what the iPad was. The iPad was like, all right, it's a tablet. Yep, it's just a nicer tablet. And that was that was enough for it to become a category. Uh, so maybe that's all it is here, but I, I'm not seeing it yet. Yeah, I think they need to make one. But I, like you, I'm just curious to see how it all plays. I'll tell you my limited experience with them. I have not used the most recent versions, but the pixelation is bad. And I think you really need to in- increase the the fidelity of it. And then mm. maybe that opens new options. And yeah. um and I think Apple's probably going to do that. I mean, the rumors are they're going to make a really expensive one. It's going to have very high end screens in it. And maybe that's what gets you over some kind of barrier just where it's suddenly more useful. But yeah, it, it, this is not the obvious need that the phone and the iPad has, but you know, those were the low hanging fruit and this is the next thing. So we'll see what, what else are you thinking for the next year? Well, when you look at like, you know, the Mac lineup, you know, I, they they have they have this gap of the Mac Pro. I do hope they close that gap. I don't know when it's coming. I hope it comes soon, and and then we can kind of you know figure out what the lineup looks like at that point. Um, but other than that, I think this is hopefully going to be a fairly quiet year in terms of like other big hardware and software shakeups. If they are indeed launching this AR platform this year. That's gonna that, that will have taken a huge amount of engineering resources out of the company's other areas to, to get that done. And, you know, I'm a developer. I'm gonna have to probably look at the developer story of it and see like 
I mean, fortunately, I don't I don't think people are going to be frequently listening to podcasts in their <laughs> VR headsets, but some people <laughs> would want to. Right. So like I'm going to have to look at, you know, do I have to make my app for this? Is there some other app I should make for this? That's just some massive opportunity that I can't pass up. Probably not. Uh, but, you know, because that's not I haven't been doing that recently, but but maybe, you know, who knows? So I think the the developer uh, burden of that platform or developer opportunities of that platform um, are something that's going to take up a lot of my time in the middle of the year or whenever this thing comes out. So that's going to be th- that's going to dominate my my like stress levels for, for the middle part of the year, like thinking like, what am I going to have to do here? Am I going to do something? And then, of course, in the middle of the year, we're also going to have beta season of the of the OSs, and I'll have to deal with that as a developer. Of, you know, whatever iOS 17 brings, hopefully it'll be a, a fairly quiet year. So we have time to focus on whatever new you know headset we have to do. But um I'm kind of hoping for a quieter year on on the rest of the fronts, just because of all that. With, with one exception, I do hope that the Apple Watch Series Nine is good <laughs> and and notable in some way, because <laughs> the you know they they released the Apple Watch Ultra this past fall, and the Ultra is is you know it's a successful product, it's, it's a good product, it's you know it's a new Apple Watch thing, but the main the main guts of the Apple Watch have barely changed in the last few years. Uh, and Series 8, actually, in my opinion, got a little bit worse because they took away the titanium option for the regular watch, <laughs> which I love. It's my favorite metal. Um, so I'm hoping the Apple Watch Series 9 this fall uh, is is actually like a, a significant update in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, um, I, I'm not I'm, I'm kind of hoping for an otherwise quiet year. I had the thought the other day, you know, they skipped the uh, the iPhone 9 and went from the 8 or really from the 7 to the 10 and then the 8 was in there. Kind of forgettable. But uh, I did have the thought, I was like, what what would like an Apple Watch 10 look like? I know it's just a number and they can just blow right <laughs> past ultra. it, you know, but like part of me hopes that the watch has been quiet because they've got something big cooking. Who knows? That's a, that's an interesting point, you know, and I wonder, you know, there, there was that rumor, um, last year the year before there were those rumors of like the the flat sided apple watch that i frankly i think that the the mock-ups of all that i think looked really bad <laughs> but but um you know i think a lot of people assumed oh that's what became the ultra maybe it's not maybe you know maybe the maybe that's just like the next generation of apple watch um we'll see uh but yeah i i kind of hope that too but really you know the apple watch for for all of its limitations it is actually a pretty mature platform at this point a pretty mature product line at this point you know it, it covers a lot of bases they've gotten rid of most of the biggest downsides and and shortcomings and, and missing pieces in the lineup um so it's overall a pretty good well-rounded product line but yeah it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere like you know in order to keep titanium i've held on to my series seven and i don't feel like i'm missing anything with the right. series, by not having the series eight like i'm missing as far like very very little as, as far as i know but you know uh so so yeah I, I hope i hope the series nine is is a is a significant jump in some way you know what i'm, what I'm really hoping for with the watch ultimately you know kind of long term it's very difficult to make apple watch software that is very good and the reasons why are because the watch is extremely aggressive at power conservation. It has to be. It's a very, very small device with a very small battery. And we ask a lot of it. So the Apple Watch in, in software is extremely aggressive at throttling apps, limiting what they can do, um, you know, blocking you know, or, or delaying network connections, delaying downloads, um, you know, trying to minimize as much power usage as possible because it, because it has to conserve that power. It's, it's so small. And that makes it very difficult to make good apps because what people expect increasingly of Apple Watch apps is to have roughly the same functionality as smartphone apps. And the Apple Watch still makes it very difficult to do things like background refresh. Um, the complication system is full of limitations of like, you know, you can only run for a couple of seconds every every so often and they, they will throttle you down at any point. You don't even necessarily know it's happening or have any control over it. Um, like with my app, I, you know, I, people always want to be able to download podcasts to the watch and play them like if they're out on a run without their phone. And those downloads, you can tell the watch to do them and the watch will say, all right, I'll get to them sometime and just sit and you well, can you can you maybe maybe get to it now? And the watch mm-hmm. will be like, oh, I'm working on it. And it just won't even start the download for a while. And then eventually it'll download it like through Bluetooth to the phone. And it's a whole like so much of the watch is limited software wise by these power conserving measures. If you look at the watch's hardware, the processor has remained 
effectively the same for three generations of the watch now. Mm -hmm. Series 6, 7, and 8 all have the same processor roughly. And so I'm hoping that in Series 9, in addition to maybe making, you know, may, may, making some kind of interesting change on the outside, what I'm hoping for the internals of, this, of Series 9 is to have a significant power savings on that processor in some way, whether they do like, you know, a process shrink or whatever they do, give that, make the Apple Watch processor or the Apple Watch in general way more power efficient. That way they can open up some of those throttles and limits on the apps and then finally allow us to make really good apps that actually have functionality our customers expect. Yeah, it feels like so many of the the decisions that that still lock watchOS to where it is were based on that original hardware, which was barely powerful enough to do what it was doing. And, you know, back then, I mean, you know this better than, than we do, uh, watch apps weren't really even applications, right? It was basically a projected view from the phone. It was really yep. weird. And they came back and said, okay, here's an SDK. And, you know, you can do stuff a bit more natively. But I- I'm hopeful... Uh, like you are, that they they are able to move the ball forward. And they've done these things to make the watch more independent from the phone. I think there's still stuff to do there as well. But I think the reality is if they can just make it a better and better satellite to the phone, then over time it'll sort of take care of itself. And they have just haven't moved the ball forward enough yet. Yeah, and, and I think we're just... It, we're, we're, we're waiting to, on some level. We're waiting for technological progress to make things more power efficient, make the battery bigger if they can and whatever else. But on, on another level, I think we're just waiting for them to realize they can loosen their grip a little bit that, mm-hmm. that, you know, that they have they have a bigger power budget than they originally did. They they can now allow more things than they did in the past and it'll be OK. Yeah, which is what they did on the phone. I mean, there was no multitasking on the phone famously. And then it was, well, you can multitask if you're these five different types of applications. And if you're not <laughs> too bad, and then eventually they opened it up to, you know, the, the model that we, we know now that yeah, some stuff is getting killed in the background. And like, it's very hard to tell on the phone, like what's actually running, what's not, but don't worry about it. And in reality, you don't have to, cause it all just kind of works. I'm hopeful the watch can make the turn too. Yeah, exactly. You know, when you guys were talking, I was thinking it's uh it's interesting to me how much of Apple's next revolutionary products are dependent on a battery revolution. Like so many of the things we want Apple to do better require a uh, battery is a limiting factor. You know, mm-hmm. the watch, uh, some of the stuff with the phone, uh, the power in the MacBooks. Uh, if they, you know, at some point we're going to go from incremental updates in batteries to like double or triple because of some scientific breakthrough. And that's going to open the floodgates for Apple. For everyone, for the whole world, look yeah. at cars. Look, I mean, there's so many areas like batteries are so important to the world now, and and whatever we can, like whatever energy density and characteristics we can squeeze out of batteries is that is the limiting factor of so many products and industries today, and it's and it's only going to continue in the future. What about the rumored 15 inch MacBook Air? We're starting to see a lot of rumors about that. That I'm actually I'm really hoping that's a real thing. You know, as I was saying earlier, the MacBook Air is such a amazing product like it, it's a it's such a solid like all-arounder great performer like best for almost everybody the one area well there, i think there's two areas that, that i would love to see um them them move it forward one would be putting ports on both sides because <laughs> i really love that from the bit from the macbook pro line um but also um just having different screen sizes and you know when you look at the macbook air when, you know to say like this computer is pretty much the best computer for pretty much everybody but to only have it available in one screen size, I think is is leaving money on the table. Now, obviously, they have to balance their needs of, you know, they don't want to cannibalize too much from the sales of the MacBook Pro. But what Apple's also been doing recently in, in recent years is having increased separation in both price and capabilities between whatever they view as like the, the quote consumer line and then their pro model. So you can look at the iPhone, look at the iPad, um, now even with the watch versus the Ultra. You know, you have you have like the regular model, like the the kind of everyday consumer model, and that's that's like what they expect most people to buy. They do the most volume in that, and then you have the pro version that might not necessarily be like just bigger, or it might not even be bigger. It might like in the case of the phone, they now have like the same screen sizes across both. Um, but the pro version is like more premium materials, maybe, and then it has more expensive hardware in some way. 
better screens, different backlight technology, you know, the, the higher refresh rate for the screens on the MacBook Pro and the, and the iPhone and everything. You know, in the phone, you have better cameras. You know, in, in the, iP- the iPad Pro, you have all these, like, you know, pro hardware features like Thunderbolt and things like that. You know, and so when you look at the the laptop line, they're still kind of in the old Apple mode of small means cheap, big means expensive. But I know a lot of people, tons of people who would love to get a 15 inch class screen in their laptop that where the, the 13 MacBook Pro is a little bit too small for them screen wise or the MacBook Air rather. But for but otherwise, the MacBook Air is great. Like like the, the screen size is the only reason that they are pushed out of that product line. And what you know, what Apple hopes will happen in that case is they go get a MacBook Pro. But the as Apple is proifying the MacBook Pro more and putting higher end components in it, the price is also going up. And the price of the MacBook Air is not. <laughs> it's staying around, you know, around eleven hundred bucks, you know, for twelve hundred, you know, around that price area. Right. So they're creating this this increased gap between those those price tiers between the MacBook Air and a 15 or 16 inch bigger bigger computer. But most people don't most people can't can't justify that price jump or can't afford that price jump. And so there's a lot of people who would get a 15 inch MacBook Air if it was available, but in its absence are not getting a 16 inch MacBook Pro. They're instead either just getting the 13 inch MacBook Air and being less happy with it, or they're going to the PC world and getting a really, you know, cheap 15 inch laptop from the pc world which is way cheaper than apple's alternative so i think that maybe they've finally decided because this does sound like a pretty solid rumor that's been around for a while and and so i hope this is real maybe they finally figured out all right the the product line is in a place now where if we launch a 15 inch version of the air it's not going to overly cannibalize the 16 inch and we will overall make more sales and i hope that's where they landed and i hope that's a real product because that there are just so many people who would buy that product and be very happy with it, and that could be a really fantastic product, you know, for for so so many people. Um, yeah. Frankly, I don't think that would be far enough. I wanted to bring back the twelve inch. I would love to see a twelve inch MacBook Air as well. Um, I, I think the the twelve inch one port MacBook uh, had a lot of problems and a lot of shortcomings that their modern technology could overcome. They they now have. You know, a better small keyboard. That's problem number one. <laughs> they have way better small chips that perform way better, have way better battery life, have, you know, way fewer compromises. They could make an amazing 12 inch with the M series of chips. And I, I hope someday that they try that again. Yeah, that computer is really before its time. I mean, with so the much. Apple Silicon, it would it would really rock right now. Yeah. And even look, even look at the 11 inch MacBook Air. That was a huge hit as well. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, I, I think in many ways, I think the, the 11-inch MacBook Air, I think in many ways, was better than the 12-inch MacBook. Um, but anyway, I would love to see them bring that size class back because the 13-inch Air is great. It's super small. It's super light. But they're, they still, I, I think they could still go smaller, you know, go from, you know, from two and a half pounds to two pounds, go from 13-inch to 12-inch, like make it a little bit smaller, make make like one of those amazing tray table dream laptops that we haven't really had from Apple in a while. All right, Mark, I got to hear from you on the Mac Pro. Uh, the uh, We we haven't got that yet. Apple was supposed to get it in two years. They didn't. But, you know, we had a little thing called COVID and other stuff going on. But w- what is a success in the Mac Pro? Because I expect we're going to get it this year. But what what are the minimum requirements you think it needs to have? I think the biggest thing is that the Mac Pro, it needs to not lose too many people from the last Mac Pro. And that sounds like the bare minimum that, you know, a new product should ideally not be worse than the thing it's replacing. Right. (laughs) But but this it's trickier here. This is a hard problem because the previous Mac Pro, the the current 2019 Intel model, has a lot of expandability inside of it in ways that we have not yet seen any of in the Apple Silicon world, namely RAM slots and external GPU or not external, but uh, third party GPU support like that. So the, the the current Mac Pro has all these slots and you can put, I think up to four, uh, third party or, you know, well, Apple provided, but you know, up to four GPUs can go in those slots and you can get nice high end GPU chips from, uh, from AMD, uh, or yeah, not Nvidia, unfortunately, but cause I know that a lot of people want that, but you know, that Apple and Nvidia, I think have some, some longstanding beef and they don't really get along anymore. But anyway, so you have this, this, this great giant tower that you can stick in a bunch of GPU power into 
and you can fill it up with a whole bunch of RAM. It supports one and a half terabytes of RAM. <laughs> and so, and you can, you can even have, you can buy this little metal bracket and you can even put three and a half inch discs in there if you want to, um, or, you know, whatever brackets you need to put a whole bunch of two and a half inch SSDs if you wanted to. So there, there's all this expandability inside in ways that no other Apple computer offers anymore. You know, and for the vast majority of Apple's computers now, I think I think all of the Apple, definitely all the Apple Silicon ones, but um, even most of the most of the latest Intel ones, you couldn't update the storage anymore. You couldn't update the RAM anymore. Um, you definitely couldn't, you know, add GPUs in easily easy ways anymore for almost all of those. And in the Apple Silicon lineup so far, you've seen none of that. Not a single Apple Silicon Mac supports any kind of expansion of memory, GPUs, or card slots or internal storage. So. For the Mac Pro of the Apple Silicon world to just match the expendability of the outgoing Intel one would be quite a departure from everything else we've seen from the Apple Silicon Mac so far. And I think that would be the most ideal success is if Apple has managed to pull that off, if they've managed to make a Mac Pro that allows expandable RAM, expandable GPUs, and expandable storage in some way, that is the, I think highest success story that we can hope for that's a huge if you know if you look at what apple silicon stuff can do so far look at the m2 pro uh lineup that we have so far or look at the mac studio um we are nowhere near one and a half terabytes of ram being supported Mm -hmm. uh we are no we we have no clue if they can do slotted gpus um you know and and none of these it's none of these things are technically impossible like these are all easy or not easy these are all possible to engineer into their architecture but all of those would require a lot of custom engineering work that would only be used in this product only the mac pro no other macs in the lineup seem to need slotted gpu support ram slot ram socket support you know so so that's those are major architectural changes and major custom work that would only be done for this one product and i i doubt whether apple is going to find that worth doing but i could be wrong so ultimately the mac pro whatever it comes out as i hope it is that i hope it is basically just a an apple silicon swap into what we currently know as the mac pro still being able to support gpus and everything else but again that's that's a pretty tall order for the apple silicon architecture to only be used in one product so while that would be my happiest outcome for this product i don't think it's the most likely the most likely to me is more like a Mac Studio than not. Uh, so maybe a smaller case. Maybe it still has card slots. Maybe it still has socketed RAM. But maybe not. I, I think both of those are, are huge toss-ups, uh, wh- whether they're supported or not in the Mac Pro. And if they, if it has neither of those, well, then it's just a Mac Studio. Right. So, you know, so you have to, you have to say, well, what, what's, what is this product differentiated by if it's going to continue to exist? And, bec- and and if, if if John Turner didn't call out in the Mac Studio introduction that the Mac Pro was a story for another day, like if he didn't say that, we would all have assumed by now there is no Mac Pro anymore. We, we would all have assumed the, the Mac Studio is the new Mac Pro. But because they called out the Mac Pro by name and promised it for later in the introduction of the Mac Studio, I'm pretty sure they still plan to make one. <laughs> so so that's um, that remains to be seen. But there, there are so many question marks on that product and what it, what it ends up being, and I, and I hope, I hope it ends up being on the good side of things, and I think it probably will be. But the, the longer we go without seeing it, the more doubt I'm going to have that like they've that they've changed direction or something has gone wrong or they've decided to abandon something. Yeah, I mean, when we were all at WWC when they announced the 2019 Mac Pro and went across the street, Apple had like this preview center and. Every professional they had there demonstrating it was using a third-party card or some sort of peripheral that they needed for their industry to do their job. And I feel like they have to have that in a Mac Pro. Or or like you said, it's just a Mac Studio, maybe a slightly better Mac Studio. And I don't know what that involves with Apple Silicon. Maybe they've got a bunch of work to do, but if they're going to make a Mac Pro and it doesn't have the ability for the sound guys to use the sound cards and the video guys to use the video cards, I'm not sure who's going to buy it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting because they're splitting a pretty small piece of their pie, right? Like you could see, and they've done it over and over, you know, how many 
$1,200 laptops can they sell? You know, for a while there were three of them, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and, and it looks like maybe with this new air, it's going to be complicated again. But the pro desktop market is like a fraction of a fraction of their Mac users. And uh, so to split these into two machines that don't have any real difference just doesn't make sense. So I am hopeful that they've got some tricks up their sleeves with this machine, doing something that we haven't seen Apple Silicon do before. Or like you said, what's the point of it? Why not just the Mac Studio? Yeah, exactly. This episode of Mac Power Users is made possible by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for building your brand or growing your business online. Squarespace is always where I start building a website, whether it's for a one-off project at work or maybe it's a freelance thing or just helping somebody with a project. It is the best place to build a website. If you're going to have a blog or a podcast, a calendar of events, maybe you need a store, digital goods, physical goods, whatever it may be, Squarespace has all the tools you need. They have a great email campaign tool so you can get site visitors on the road to becoming a customer. Of course, you can apply your brand and your colors and everything from your site over to your email campaign so they all look cohesive like they're from a professional And of course, they have great SEO tools as well. I find SEO tools kind of overwhelming at times. Squarespaces are really easy to understand, and they work both with the website and those email campaigns. I love building on Squarespace. It's great to get something up and running quickly that looks great. It can grow with you over time. You can add these features to it as you need them without having to burn down and rebuild your whole website. And that is really awesome. So if you're looking to get started, Head to squarespace.com slash MPU for a free trial. There's no credit card required. And when you're ready to sign up, when you're ready to launch that website, you're going to use the code MPU. That's going to get you 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain name. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash MPU and the code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase and to show your support for the show. Our thanks to Squarespace for their support of Mac Power users and all of Relay FM. So, Marco, you've been developing for Apple platforms for a long time, Overcast now, Instapaper before. What's the general state of the programming world right now for people making apps for Mac? I mean, we got the big Swift UI announcement a few years ago. You know, what are your thoughts as someone who's in the weeds on this stuff? This is actually going to be my major project for 2023, I hope. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in the early stages of it now. I'm trying to migrate Overcast from its, you know, nearly decade old. Objective C UI kit code base to the modern world of Swift and Swift UI. And this has been a, a huge undertaking. It's going to remain it's gonna it remains to be a huge, a huge undertaking I still have to do most of. Um and and this is this is gonna be most of my year, I think. Um I, I hope it's only this year. <laughs> we'll see. It could be longer. Um because, you know, when I launched Overcast originally, Swift wasn't even out yet. And then and it came out. And I was like, well, this doesn't really do things the way I like. I'm already an Objective-C expert. You know, why would I move to this new language? And it was still very early. And the language was still changing quickly. The tooling was still pretty rough in the early days. And then eventually Swift became pretty good. And now it's really good. And they, they keep adding things to the language that, that make it even better for the most part. You know, they, they're making it, you know, complicated as heck, but they are making it overall better. Um, and Swift UI had basically the same pattern. It just started later. You know, Swift UI launched for the first time a few years back. Um, I believe with that 2019 Mac Pro, I believe that's when it launched. <laughs> um, and they, you know, they Swift UI had also, you know, very rough early days. Um, and it's, you know, bad, again, bad problems with the tooling, bugs in the compiles of it. Um, you know, a lot of sh- uh, shortcomings and missing features and, and you know, framework bugs and, and just overall problems and clunkiness. And they've been working on that since, since that time. And over the last few years, you know, every, every year Swift UI gets better and faster and more usable and more friendly. And the tooling for it gets better and, and less insanely hostile and less insanely slow. Um, and so Swift reached the point that I should have been using it years ago. Swift UI reached that point this year um, that, you know, it, it, Swift UI has just gotten there, I think, where you can now confidently build new stuff using all Swift and all Swift UI, or at least mostly Swift UI if you really have to. Um, and you're not really missing out on much and you won't have too many problems that you wouldn't have otherwise. 
and you know and that's that's now a, a a pretty good place to go i think for most people so i'm i i feel like i'm actually very well timed here my my slackerness with moving the app to swift has also now gotten me into the world of being able to move to swift ui also at the same time so instead of ever writing it in swift and ui kit i can now go directly from objective c ui kit to swift and swift ui and also switch new async stuff which is which is very powerful and, and very very handy to use um so i feel like this is actually a great time for that um and and overall i'd say the state of this world is very good like it's it's mature um it's still you know swift ui still has a long way to go in terms of you know adding things people want and making things a little bit easier definitely could use some improvement in the tooling and massively can use improvement in documentation and tutorials and examples and debugging um you know the these are all it's still a young ish platform swift ui uh but it's 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 pretty good now and when you're like on the swift ui train when you're when you're like in the groove getting things done you know just cranking out swift ui code and and iterating quickly and tweaking things quickly it is so awesome when you're in that mode and yeah occasionally you do you know, crash into a wall really hard and burst into flames and, and have to lose an afternoon to some <laughs> weird problem. But for the most part, when you're going, it's really nice. The, um, you know, so for a couple of years there, we were talking, joking earlier about, you know, the Mac going away. It seemed like, you know, the Mac was in the wilderness, but Apple was in the background working on Apple Silicon and everything turned around. I think you could argue the same thing for Swift and Swift UI, that those were long-term projects and bets Apple made that are now starting to pay off. Um, are there, as someone who's watching this stuff, is there any other products or, or, um, you know, basic services you think that Apple currently has in the wilderness that is on a similar path? I mean, are they, are they about to turn anything around that you see needs turning around? Hmm. That's a, that's a really good question. I think the design of Mac OS is in the wilderness for sure. Uh, yeah. but, but, you know, at least on, you know, in the, in the code and services and API la- layers, um, I, I think one of the biggest areas that that the programming world is lacking is in a modern replacement for core data. This is their database data storage layer they wrote a million years ago, uh, and core data is very unswift like, very you know, kind of um, hostile to the to the Swift and Swift UI worlds. Uh, and you know you can use it. Many people do, uh, but it really was not designed for that. And, and it shows. And and if they if they redid a modern data layer, especially if they built it from the start to be synced with iCloud, uh, that could be very powerful. Uh, and and I think I think the the iOS world needs that. You know, right now they they've had so many attempts they've taken at trying to make core data sync with iCloud in some way. There's been multiple different versions of this over the years. None of them have worked particularly well. Uh, every version they make works a little bit less terribly than the one before it. Uh, so that they're on the right path there. But ultimately, what I hope they're working on at some point from from that layer is, uh, you know, a, a, a modern replacement for core data that also can easily sync. Um, on on the larger scale, that's not necessarily directly related to APIs. I hope they're doing some kind of uh, wilderness rescue for Siri. That's so badly needed. Siri is still so inconsistent and buggy and oftentimes just dumb or makes rudimentary mistakes or nonsensical mistakes um, that that the other uh, competing uh, voice assistant products don't do nearly as much, if at all. Um, So I I hope Apple realizes how mediocre Siri is and has some kind of massive effort underway to, to modernize it and make it better because as Apple pushes more and more into various areas of their products, you look at something like AirPods, HomePods, probably the the AR VR headset. Uh, they're leaning more heavily on Siri than ever. Look, the Apple Watch too. Like the Apple Watch is such a great Siri machine when it works. Uh, they they lean very hard on Siri for many of their latest products and product directions, and yet it's so mediocre and so inconsistent, and that holds their products back. And it's and you can't look at any review of something that's Siri dependent, like the HomePod or AirPods. They all say the same thing. It's like, yeah, this is this is great hardware. Siri sucks. And they they all say it, and, and that's going to keep appearing in every single review of their products, and it's going to keep being a a burden on the user experience of using these products until Siri gets massively better. And this isn't some kind of thing where where there is no 
technological way to do this. It isn't that this is impossible. You can look at Alexa or Google Assistant and you can see, oh, this, these are fast and good and consistent and reliable. Uh, and those are all things Siri is not. Uh, from your lips to Tim's ears. I sure hope so. One thing that's interesting in the move with Swift and Swift UI is, is I think Apple's trying to get people where they can have as simple as a code base as possible and run their app across a bunch of different Apple platforms. And we've seen that sort of in fits and starts and things like Matt Catalyst that are there to kind of help bridge the gap. But in, you know, computing history in terms of consumer level devices, no company's really ever pulled that off. Microsoft tried and failed. I mean, Microsoft's biggest uh, problem is their massive, massive technical debt, and they have to support systems and, and legacy this and legacy that. Apple is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. They are pretty willing to move forward and, and break things. And you know, sometimes they give you warning, sometimes they don't. Do you think that this idea of you know one application that can scale from an Apple Watch up to you know TVOS, you know big you know sixty inch television in someone's living room, like Mark, do you think that's feasible, or do you think there's always going to be, uh, or at least for the foreseeable future, a case for bespoke apps that are more specialized for the platform they're targeted against? I think the the idea of having like literally one code base that you just compile for all these platforms and the interface just gracefully adopts to all of them. Uh, that has been a pipe dream of the computer world for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And we've never achieved it. We've, we, we've achieved things that can approximate it in usually pretty mediocre ways with pretty mediocre results, but we've never really achieved that. And it's probably not because everyone's an idiot. It's probably because it's impossible. Um, the good thing is with Apple's platforms, with the modern platforms now, there's, there's way more opportunity than ever before to share lots of the code, not necessarily all of the code, but you can share huge amounts of the code between Apple's platforms. Now you can have like all of the low level stuff being Swift and Swift async and all this stuff. You can have all of the UI components, like individual components, you can have those be Swift UI, and those do a pretty decent job of adopting uh, between different platforms. But the like main interfaces, like the main screens, and deciding what's on screen and what's not, and and how things should be organized, what features should even be available on different platforms, I think there's always going to be a need to customize that between platforms that are very different from each other. So you can look at something like you know the, the Apple Watch and the Apple TV versus iOS, right? These are extremely different needs, different priorities. You know, the Apple TV, you have to optimize for a totally different and much more limited input mechanism than just a touchscreen. Um, on the Apple Watch, you have a way smaller screen. You have way less space for anything on screen than you do with, with anything else. And it's going to be one-handed. It's going to only be on screen for a few seconds. You have limited background abilities, as we talked about earlier, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, then you look at, you know, Mac, iPad and even iPhone, those can all share much more between themselves than the kind of edge case platforms. If we're moving towards a world where we're going to have an AR VR kind of headset, that's going to be another one of these very different platforms where you're not going to have this, you're not going to have like an iPhone app running in a window in your VR headset with no other change and have that be a good experience. Um, So we're always going to have to customize things to some degree to optimize them for the platforms that they're on when the platforms are radically different from each other or have some kind of radically different input mechanism or limitation or, or whatever. Um, and most of what Apple does has those limitations. Um, you know, you look at, like, if you want to have something that has a Siri interface to run on a HomePod maybe in the future, that's going to have no screen. <laughs> so that's going to be totally different. Or having to, run, having to run on AirPods, you know, that's, again, that's a, that's a screenless interaction. So that, that's a very different experience than having something run on an Apple TV, which is pretty much all screen, but you can't use a mouse to interact with it or a finger or, you know, and there's no keyboard pretty much. And so there's like, there's so many different aspects of these different platforms. I I feel like you're never going to have just build this one app in this one way in this one configuration and have it run on everything and have it be a good experience. That's never going to happen. Marco, we always like to wrap up these interviews talking about some of your favorite apps and services, uh, menu bars, you know, apps on your phone, your Mac. What, 
blows your hair back these days? So I'm going to say uh, the, kind of two boring answers and one fun one. So so my my uh, boring number one is the um, the Lutron Caseta line of smart home products. Yeah. This is not quite an app, but it has an app because, <laughs> um, you know, smart home stuff is so cool and it's so much fun when it works. And then when it doesn't work, it's so much less fun, especially when like you set everything up and then you want to show it off to your family and they try it and it doesn't work and they give you that look. You know, we all know we've all we've all gotten that look. Oh you know, yeah. If you if you never want to get that look again, use Lutron Caseta stuff because it just works. Like it, for through for lots of various technical reasons that aren't very interesting, um, it's basically way more reliable than any other smart home stuff I've ever used. You set it up and it just works. And and you can either you can you can either use their like switched smart outlets or you can actually replace the light switches in your walls with their smart light switches. Either way, I strongly recommend it. It's been great. Um, yeah. Secondly, I I'm loving the new Ivory app for Mastodon. You know, we all kind of, well, not not everybody, but most of most of my crew um, has fled Twitter over the last couple of months, uh, and we many of us collected over on Mastodon. And the what has made this very smooth of a transition is that Tapbots, who made who makes or made Tweetbot, uh, the wonderful Twitter client that that was recently killed by Twitter. Thanks, thanks guys. Uh, <laughs> thanks Twitter for that. Um, you know, uh, Tweetbot was my interface to Twitter. Like w- when I was using Twitter, I was really using Tweetbot. I, I never went to like the Twitter website or anything, or used their their own terrible apps. Um, and so, Tweetbot, when when Twitter started going downhill quickly, Tweetbot. Um, put together in remarkable time a client called ivory which is basically a tweet bot for mastodon and so i was able to switch over to mastodon and follow many of the same people i followed on twitter and have the app work the same way and feel the same and have very similar features and similar design as what i was already accustomed to and so i was able to move from twitter over to a new network and not have it be incredibly jarring and terrible of a transition period. Like it just, oh, this is just nice. And so now I'm on Mastodon and most of the people I followed on Twitter are there as well. And I have this wonderful app called Ivory that, that you can use to browse it. And there, you know, the, the phone version's out. The Mac version is about to be out. I'm, I'm in the beta testing. Thank God for that. <laughs> and that's going to be out soon. And it is just a, a, a wonderful transition because we've actually finally broken the the centralization of social networks like in this this kind of unexpected twist that you know twitter happened to go downhill very quickly and we all in my group happened to go over to this one other place that happens to be this like decentralized federated open protocol that's wonderful and so we're kind of never again going to have to deal with the the flaws of having our social network be centralized and proprietary and owned by this one poorly run corporation so all that is thanks to all the hard work of Mastodon's, uh, you know, authors and maintainers and the people who run Mastodon instances, and thanks to the wonderful Mastodon clients, of which my favorite is Ivory. Uh, and then finally, uh, I I learned um, there's a wonderful show called Launched by Charlie Chapman, uh, where he interviews uh, iOS app developers, and I, I I've been on it uh, the last year sometime and. He just came out with a whole bunch of new episodes, and I, and I, I always learn about fun apps from this show because usually, like, he'll have he'll have a developer on who I've never heard of, and they'll talk about their app, and I'll be like, "Wait a minute, I want to use that app. That sounds good." Yeah, I, I actually, I would I, that that sounds amazing, and I've I've discovered so many great apps uh, through Launched, uh, and and one of them is my third pick for this. It's called Up Ahead. So good, and so good, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the it sounds really simple, and it is really simple, but it's one of those things that's a very well executed version of a simple concept. And so it's, I use it as, as the home screen widget. I think that's the main way you're supposed to use it um, where you can, you can define events that are happening in the future that are important to you for some reason. So, you know, our schools are about to go on winter break. So I had winter break in there when I was, when I was planning my wife's big birthday party, we had a big birthday for her this year. Uh, Cause it was, it was one of those big round numbers um, that like her birthday was in there as, and it was like, all right, her, and, and you can have on your home screen, you can have it count down. So it's always showing, you know, up next Tiff's birthday, 15 days away and you can customize it and everything. And so you can always see, you know, how often you look at your phone's, your phone's home screen all the time. Right. So you can always see a reminder in the corner or the, wherever you put it like, Oh, 
coming up in, in, in two days, I have winter break. You know, in 15 days, I have my wife's birthday. I got, I got a plan for this. I got to expect it. You know, so and then the, and it's done in just these beautiful designs like you know, the, the up next or the up ahead design is is just fantastic. Like this is the kind of app that I almost feel like no one's making apps this good anymore. No one's designing things this well anymore. Like this is the kind of app that it, it reminds me a lot of the early iPhone days when it was still a lot of the like indie Mac scene doing most of the good software development. Uh, and so everything was like very carefully crafted and a wonderful artwork and wonderful design and very user centric, not trying to like, you know, shove crap down your throat, like so many modern apps do. Um, and this is, this is that kind of app and you don't get a lot of these anymore. So strongly recommend, uh, up ahead. Yeah. And it's just delightful, right? You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, that's a good one. That's a good one. Marco, it's so nice having you on the show again. It's been way too long. Uh, hopefully, we won't have a complete Apple Silicon transition between now and the next time you're on. <laughs> um, but you, know, you never know. And uh, either way, uh, always curious to hear what you have to say. I love the uh, ATP podcast you do over there. Uh, I'm an Overcast user. I'm using all the things from Marco, and you should too. If you're listening, go check them out. So you can go check out ATP at ATP.fm, Overcast over at Overcast.fm. Anywhere else people should go look at you. What, what, where are you on Mastodon, Marco? Uh, I don't even know. It's like there's a bunch of at symbols, but a Marco Armit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Good enough. We'll see if we can find a link and put it in the show notes for you. And uh, we are the Mac Power Users. You can find us over at Relay.fm slash MPU. Thank you to our sponsors today, SaneBox, Rocket Money, and Squarespace. And we'll see you next time.